Okay, well, thank you for this opportunity. I went through the, the handbook, the Facebook, um, just before coming into the room and uh, was astounded by the variety of people who are here. Um, it's really a very exciting opportunity for somebody like me who's spent the last 10 years at the Fletcher School, before that at the United Nations, uh, to have a chance to interact with, um, with people with your, your backgrounds and your very diverse backgrounds. So um, what I'm going to do is, um, is offer um, a lecture, um, what I think is in a way a sustained argument about uh, democracy promotion by international organizations. And by international organizations, I'm focusing on intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations and the European Union and the African Union and the Organization of American States, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the punchline, um, I'm a lawyer, but I've always taught and done research at the intersection of international law and politics. And the punchline uh, for the argument is that there is no international right to democracy. There is no right to democracy in international law. But there is a lot of activity at the international level, both normative and operational, which suggests there's a growing consensus, a growing international consensus, maybe not universal, but a growing consensus around the value of democratic governance. And a lot of that activity is occurring in international organizations uh, or being engaged in by international organizations. And that uh, is significant because international organizations, intergovernmental organizations, tend to represent the lowest common denominator. Um, so if that's true, if you can get 192 states in the United Nations to agree on something, uh, it means that there's got to be something going on here. How deep it goes, how strong the commitment is, is a subject for discussion. But there is something going on here. And my sense is, and this is where I'd be really interested in hearing your reaction, my sense that is if, if this is true, it creates a lot of space for people like you. Okay? There, is a, there, there is a normative consensus around the idea of democracy here. There's not a right to democracy in international law, but there's a consensus. That consensus is growing. That is being expressed in, through, and by intergovernmental organizations. And that means for people working on the ground, people interacting with governments, intergovernmental organizations, civil society, there's something they can point to to say this is a universal value, this is a global value, this is a, a consensus here that you in some way or form have committed to and therefore uh, you have a responsibility to, to react, at least to listen to us. Um, uh, I will lecture, but feel free to interrupt me. Um, ask questions. I'm not exactly sure how long a, this lecture would take, so, so please, please interrupt. Uh, we want to make sure we give a chance to Stephen Zunias as well, so we'll do our best to keep on track here, but I certainly don't mind being uh, stopped along the way, and if I decide there are things I need to, to push through, I'll let you know and we'll get there. So Stephen has his chance to, to comment and then we can have a good full discussion. Okay? Um, democratic governance, I don't want to get tangled up in definitions here. Uh, when I talk about democracy and democratic governance, I'm basically talking about the, the broad proposition that the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. Okay? We can have a long discussion about how you define democracy, uh, but that's not really going to be helpful for immediate purposes. Um, this proposition is set out in Article 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted in 1948 is now broadly seen as customary law. So um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at least um, has in it some language which is the starting point. And that language has been built on uh, and um, there's been a lot of work done in international organizations to try to push that agenda forward. Um, Secretary General Boutros Ghali, who was uh, Secretary General from Egypt, he was Secretary General, not the previous Secretary General, but before Kofi Annan. We have Ban Ki-moon now, Kofi Annan preceded him, Boutros Ghali preceded Kofi Annan. Uh, there from 1990, let's see if I've got this right, 1992 to 1996, something like that. So in the early post-Cold War era. And at the very end of his term, first term, and he only got one term, Secretary General Boutros Ghali published something called the Agenda for Democratization. And basically it was an argument that the UN was properly engaged in democracy promotion. Okay? 
The word democracy doesn't appear in the UN Charter anywhere, and therefore there's some controversy around this. The idea that the UN should be involving itself in the form of government was not obvious to all concerned, but Boutros Ghali made it one of the hallmarks of his term as Secretary General to push this agenda, and he left on his way out the door the agenda for democratization. And he says that the starting point for this, and the starting point for this normative consensus that I've been describing, are, are three documents, three key documents. Okay? The UN Charter itself, democracy doesn't appear there, but the very first words of the preamble are we the peoples. Okay? The UN Charter was written in the name of we the peoples of the world. Um, and as Boutros Ghali put it, what that suggests is that the Charter itself, and I'm quoting from him, roots the sovereign authority of states and therefore the legitimacy of the UN in the will of the people. Okay? Now this is a pretty creative, expansive interpretation of what the UN Charter says. Uh, he was acting as a norm entrepreneur here. He was trying to push the boundaries. He was trying to make a case. Uh, but he went right back to the UN Charter and he talked about that language, we the peoples, and he also pointed to the language in there about human rights and self-determination and fundamental freedoms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay? Alongside or shortly after the UN Charter, he uh, pointed to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 21 in particular, which I've just mentioned. Um, and by the way, I've, some of these it documents are up on the whatever it is, your website. Um, a lot of them, of course, are easily accessible through the internet. Um, so when I refer to some of these names and, and uh, articles and whatnot, you can find them easily enough. Um, so we've got Article 21, which talks about um, uh, the will of the people and all persons having the right to take part in their government. And it's also got lots of language in there about civil and political rights and self-determination, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, et cetera, et cetera. So there's plenty in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then he also pointed to the Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Peoples, which was adopted in the General Assembly in 1960, which was really all about the right to self-determination, giving content to that language which appears in the UN Charter. Okay? And so in his, uh, in his bold uh, way, he said, this um, provides a clear and solid foundation for the United Nations to be in the business of promoting democracy. Okay? Um, he didn't get a second term, so he wasn't around to carry this agenda forward, and uh, it didn't necessarily take off in quite the way he was hoping, um, but he made the case, and he made it well, and the case he made was largely repeated by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in something that's up on your, what do you call it? Is it a web? Your your e-classroom, all right, it's up in your e-classroom, uh, the Secretary General's guidance note on democracy. And he does something similar. He starts in a couple, the first couple of pages articulating the basis for the UN's role in democracy promotion and democratization. And it's not all that different from what Secretary General Boutros Ghali said uh, 15, uh, 16 years ago. Okay? So that's a starting point, and that's the UN. At the regional level, Plenty of regional organizations have in their constitutions, their constitutive instruments, uh, democracy promotion as a goal. Okay? So the European Union, pretty obvious. And the European organizations, it's not surprising. NATO, European Union, OSCE. Okay? Maybe a little more surprising to some is the extent to which democracy is at the core of the mission of the Organization of American States. It goes right back to 1945 and was reinforced um, with a number of key documents that I'll come back to, especially in the post-Cold War era. Uh, the Andean community, Mercosur, the new sub-regional entity called UNASUR, all have democracy promotion in there somewhere. In Africa, the African Union, very strongly asserted in its purposes and principles. ECOWAS, the Economic Community for West African States. Okay? So we've got Europe, not surprising, Americas, Probably not so surprising. Africa, getting a little more surprising. And Asia, always the part of the world which seemed to have the most 
the sharpest differences with the Western world on normative issues, values, et cetera, et cetera. But even ASEAN, the Charter of ASEAN, the Association for Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, has now in its 2007 charter democracy as one of its purposes, one of its founding values. Okay, So there's something going on, at least in Southeast Asia as well. There are some exceptions here as far as the regional organizations are concerned. SARC, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, the Arab League, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, not there, but not necessarily uh, irrelevant to what they're doing, and I'll come back to that a little bit as well. Okay. Uh, continuing down this sort of list, bits of evidence, pieces of evidence of an emerging consensus on democratic governance, the right to political participation. Okay? This is in Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It guarantees the right to political participation and it spells out in some detail what that means. It leaves open some interesting and very important questions. Most importantly, does it include multi-party democracy? Okay? Can the right to political participation be guaranteed in a one-party state? And the answer, not in the, right to, in the covenant itself, but the answer through practice, which I'm going to argue, is that no. Multi-party democracy is now a part of our understanding of what the right to political participation means in international law. And that's happened through operational activities. Okay? It has not happened because states have sat around a table and said, let's now give some content to this right. It happened because there's been a lot of this operational activity to promote democracy, which has reinforced that notion and, I would argue, hardened it as a matter of law. And I'll come back to that as well. Okay? Uh, the almost identical language is used in a number of regional human rights conventions in Europe, Americas, and Africa. Um, there's some jurisprudence around all of those. Won't get into the details, but certainly in Europe, there's a lot um, coming out of the European Court of Human Rights and, to a lesser extent, the European Court of Justice. But even at the UN level, the UN Human Rights Committee, there's some jurisprudence. Okay? They've got these big jamborees, these big democracy conferences, which really began in the late 90s, early uh, part of this century. Um, one set of conferences is called Conferences of New and Restored Democracies. Uh, there have been five or six of those. The most recent, to the best of my knowledge, was in Qatar in 2006. About 100 countries participate in those. Okay. There are another set of conferences uh, called the Community of Democracies Conferences. Uh, those also began around the same time in the year 2000. I'm not quite sure why you had these two different streams. I think it was something to do with France versus the U.S., but we don't need to get into that. Uh, but this community of democracies is meeting on a regular basis. Um, the next conference, I think it's the sixth or seventh, is scheduled to take place on July 1st in Lithuania. Okay? And these are really just big, big talk shops where governments get together. Um, not a whole lot comes out of them that's concrete, but the idea that you've got 100 or 120 countries getting together on a regular basis declaring, reaffirming their commitment to democratic principles um, is not insignificant. And out of the Community of Democracies Conference, something called the Council of the Community of Democracies was created, which is like a secretariat for this conference. And the secretariat is essentially a non-governmental organization. Okay? So it's a way for civil society actors, non-governmental actors, to follow up on whatever takes place at these conferences. Okay? Um, one, one thing that did come out of them, something quite concrete, is in the UN there's something now something called the Democracy Caucus, okay? uh, which means that in the General Assembly at least, uh, from time to time, not very often, not very effectively, the democracies, something like 60 or 70 or 80 of them, get together and try to work out joint positions. And to the best of my knowledge, the most significant thing they've done is to join forces in pushing for reform of and transformation of the Human Rights Commission into the Human Rights Council, okay? And looking at what the composition of that should be and what the criteria for membership should be and whatnot. And that hasn't been a huge success, but at least it was an evidence of a joint effort by the world's democracies, okay? Um, what else? 
Human Rights Commission, 1999, adopted a resolution entitled Promotion of the Right to Democracy. The vote on that resolution was 51 to 0. Two countries abstained, Cuba and China. And Cuba and China abstained not because they opposed the idea that democracy should be promoted, but they didn't like the idea of describing it as a right. Okay? They thought promotion of democracy would be fine, a right to democracy, no, not interested. They didn't vote against it, they abstained. Okay? Um, close to two-thirds of the world states, I'm sure somebody will want to challenge me on this, um, but close to two-thirds of the world states are committed, at least in principle, to multi-party, secret ballot, universal suffrage elections. Now the numbers go up and down. There are various organi organizations that you're familiar with and maybe some of you work with and for, Freedom Forum, etc., that tries to monitor this. I just had a quick look and Freedom Forum 2011 says there are 115 electoral democracies in the world. Okay? Um, there were actually, according to um, somebody in the UN, a few more than that several years ago. So the numbers are not necessarily in an upward trajectory, but uh, nevertheless, we're talking about a significant number of countries in the world. Okay? Secretary General Kofi Annan, between Boutros Ghali and Ban Ki-moon, leading to the World Summit of 2005. This was the big event. All the heads of state and prime ministers and presidents were going to get together and at a minimum adopt a declaration about their common interests and values. And Kofi Annan put in a report that went to that World Summit a paragraph declaring democracy not to be a universal value, but in fact a universal right. Okay? Paragraph 149 of his of his report called In Larger Freedom, democracy does not belong to any country or region but is a universal right. Okay? The World Summit didn't go quite that far, but in the declaration that came out of that, they declared 192 countries by consensus declared democracy to be a universal value. Okay? And they set up something called the Democracy Fund to promote that. And that fund has been busy ever since, essentially giving money towards initiatives undertaken by civil society representatives. Okay. Um, and then finally, Ban Ki-moon's guidance note of 2008. Okay. In that, he reiterates some of the things that Boutros Ghali said. He lists eight principles that ought to guide UN activities, and he actually describes the eight areas in which the UN is active and should be more active. And one of those is support to civil society, pushing for political pluralism, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the, the normative stuff. These are the written bits of paper. Um, not hard law. Some of it's hard law. It's international human rights law. Some of it is so-called soft law, like this declaration that came out of the world some of it, summit. And some of it is just strongly worded positions taken by senior officials. I've mentioned a, two, a couple by the Secretary Generals of the United Nations, but you could probably point to similar statements, reports by the heads of the African Union or the Organization of American States, et cetera, et cetera, where they're essentially trying to articulate this norm and trying to build some consensus around its meaning. More important, in my view, than these sort of normative statements are the operational activities. Okay? And what I mean by that are the programmatic activities undertaken by international organizations on the ground, electoral assistance, humanitarian action, peacekeeping, okay? not sitting in the General Assembly or the Security Council or the African Union Peace and Security Council reaching agreements, but out there on the ground doing things. Okay? And um, Boutros Ghali made the case for the UN engaging in this kind of activity despite the fact that it looks like it's a Western agenda. He made the case for it um, by producing this document, Agenda for Democratization, and he defined what he was getting at here in a way that hopefully everybody could accept. Okay? So he articulated in that document, democratization is a process. It's a process that fosters a more open, participatory society. The UN's job is not to impose a particular model of democracy, not even to push for a particular model of democracy. And the UN does this when requested. Okay? So he described it as democracy assistance. It's not democracy at the point of a gun, 
but democracy assistance, a little bit like development assistance. Who can complain about the UN being in favor of assisting governments that are interested in democratizing? That can't be a violation of Article 27 of the UN Charter. Article 27 says that the UN shall not interfere in matters that are essentially domestic. Okay? So those who would be opposed to this kind of activity who could point to Article 27. Boutros Ghali's response, Ban Ki-moon's response, Kofi Annan's response is that we're not interfering in domestic matters because we're only acting when we're requested to act. Okay? And um, he also, at least in trying to justify this as a UN activity, pointed to the linkages between democracy, peace, and development. And essentially he said that in order to maintain, restore international peace and security, the UN should be in the business of promoting participatory governance at a minimum. Development requires good governance, participatory governance, some respect for democratic principles. So he basically said that these are the three pillars of what the UN does, peace, development, and human rights slash democracy, and they're all interconnected. Okay, so again, he's trying to make the case here. Okay. What do the international organizations do? The most obvious uh, and the most um, important, in a way, is electoral assistance. Okay. And you know, I can go through the long list, but pretty much all of the organizations that I've already mentioned, starting with the UN down through the European and uh, African and American regional organizations, are engaged in electoral assistance in some form. And the form this takes is at the upper end of the spectrum, actually conducting and organizing election. Okay. This is usually in post-conflict societies. Okay. There's no infrastructure to organize an election. And the international organization, either the UN or the Organization of American States or often the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, actually organizes the election from beginning to end. Okay. Next level down, I'm going through the five here. Next level down, supervision. What that means is the international organization doesn't conduct the election, but super supervises every step of the process. Meaning that when the electoral commission is established, the international organization in effect says, okay, this meets international standards. Okay. When the campaign is underway, the international organization monitors the campaign and intervenes if it looks like there's some uh, dirty dealing going on. Uh, obviously monitors the polls and at the end of it declares whether or not the election has been free and fair. Okay? Uh, that's the third level down, the verification. It doesn't supervise every step of the way, but it verifies whether the elections were free and fair. Okay? Fourth level, coordinating international observers. Fifth level, technical assistance. Okay? The important point here is the first three, okay? conducting, supervising, or verifying an election in effect is a way of conver converting legitimacy on the winner of the election. Okay. And that is interesting because in the old days, okay, going back to 1648 or as far back as you may want to go, the idea that governments would want or feel they need the legitimacy that comes from some outside organization, some outside group, giving them the stamp of legitimacy that isn't consistent with traditional notions of state sovereignty. Okay? That's more along the lines of popular sovereignty. The idea that how a government comes to power and how a government rules is a matter of international concern and governments want some certification. Now they're going to play all sorts of games and the interesting thing is there's a lot, much higher demand, maybe not so much over the, in the last few years, but certainly in the early post-Cold War era, much higher demand for this kind of electoral verification than international organizations are willing to supply. Governments are saying, come, come willing and able for that matter, come, you know, send, send your observers, we want you to certify the election. Sometimes they say, don't send 100 observers, send three, that's all you need. You, know, you can certify it, you just have to wander around, you'll see it's all fine, it's free and fair. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. There's also a shift within the elections monitoring industry itself that far more important than international observers are local observers because they remain, they're on the ground, and the development of their capacity is much more important 
for the protection of democracy in the long run. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think that has probably sunk in in the United Nations as well, because the UN does much less electoral observation and more coordinating and trying to sp find some space for national electoral observers. Yeah, so absolutely. And it's also part of the democratization agenda, which is to build up local institutions. And those local institutions may be civil society groups, non-governmental organizations who can, and the media for that matter, who can better monitor and speak out on electoral questions. Yes. Um, there's also another term, so rather than talk about electoral assistance, you talk about ele electoral cycle support. Because you're moving away from an event-driven type of support where you would just support sort of the election day rather than treat elections as any type of political process requiring support maybe 10 years at a time. Uh -huh. So yeah. that's also fine with my and, and the electoral, the, the support you're talking about, would it be described as electoral support or political support or support for participatory governance? What, what kind of support are we talking about here? Well, I would call it, well, not I, but it's called, so the surface electoral cycle approach. Okay. And the thing, the point is that you, it's not event driven. You would support electoral processes like you would work with the parliament. You know, yeah. you don't just go in and go out, a bit like, like uh, Mayor was indicating but with lots of international experts. Yeah. It's like any development, or any type of capacity development. Yeah. So I wouldn't really say political, that's a different thing. I mean, yeah. that's a diplomatic thing. Okay. That, that's sort of over and beyond. Okay. But I'm talking about the development corporation part. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's, and in a way, that's the sort of next, uh, the next point here is it's not even electoral cycle necessarily. It's not necessarily tied to an election or the cycle or the activities around elections, but the promotion of good governance. And now increasingly international organizations have made good governance promotion a priority of their development activities. Okay? The U U World Bank in a way started this and it was viewed with suspicion because the World Bank's notion of good governance was perceived essentially as a neoliberal agenda. It was all part of structural adjustment and conditionality and whatnot. Interestingly, the UNDP got out ahead of the World Bank, taking the position that it's a more trusted partner in the global south of the developing countries. It doesn't have many resources. And so the one thing it can do is provide policy advice. And policy advice could and should take the form of the promotion of good governance. And UNDP went so far as to say, and let's, let's call a spade a spade here. We're talking about democratic governance. Let's not be afraid of that word. You know, it includes all sorts of things. It includes things like um, uh, civilian control over the military, uh, strengthening the institutions of democracy, strengthening the media, strengthening uh, civil society institutions. Uh, promoting the rule of law and transparency, all of that business. And, and the UNDP stuck its neck out and in effect said this is democratic governance. And this was articulated in the 2002 UNDP Human Development Report. Okay? And again, that was a bold move because a lot of countries would have said, oh, this sounds an awful lot like the World Bank, uh, the UNDP, now headed by a former vice president of the World Bank, Mark Malik Brown, seems to be setting this organization up as a branch plant of the World Bank. You know, you're doing the, the, the World Bank's dirty work. But, you know, I don't see it that way. I think there's obviously some, some issues here, but I don't see it that way. And I think the idea that development organizations like UNDP should be engaged in the business of good governance is, is broadly seen as appropriate. Uh, and part of this bigger democratization agenda. Maybe, you know, a, only a little sliver of it, and, uh, but it's not insignificant. The other part of this, and it, it relates a little bit to what Helena was saying as well, is that democratization is a central element of peace building in post-conflict societies. Okay? So this is one fairly limited category of places where international organizations are promoting democracy post-conflict societies, but there um, is, uh, has been, at least until recently, conventional wisdom that one of the best things that a peace operation can do to promote, inculcate sustainable peace is to, 
contribute to the creation of institutions which will allow for the nonviolent conflict resolution. So you're not trying to get rid of conflict altogether. Every society has conflicts. But in these societies, typically those conflicts were resolved through violent means. This is a way of finding legal and political and other channels to resolve the conflict. So that idea was everybody nodded politely and says yes. Everybody also learned how hard that was uh, and learned how little maybe that outsiders can do in that. And this comes back to Mary's point, what outsiders can do in this. And isn't it really the, the local actors that need to be doing this? But when you've got a big international presence in a post-conflict society, you've got to ask yourself, well, what are we doing there? Are we just standing around? Trying to, get, trying to ensure that there's no extreme violence, or are we trying to do something more? And, and this has become a subject of debate. And some have, there's been a backlash against this, because if you go beyond, let's say, holding an election to promoting the rule of law and helping to build justice institutions and political institutions, all of a sudden you're deeply involved in domestic processes. And it starts to look an awful lot like a neoliberal Western-driven agenda here. And A, that's normatively inappropriate, and B, it's not going to work. So there's been a reaction to this um, liberal peace building. A lot of critics are starting to say this whole business has gone way too far in that direction. Uh, but I think to this day, most people involved in the business agree that the promotion of some kind of participatory governance has to be part of a, of a peace process okay, in the aftermath of an internal conflict. Okay? So these, these are the various pieces. Um, I, I don't want to, I've got to make sure I give Stephen some time. So let me, let me rush through a few more things here. Um, this, this slide here is the connection between normative and operational activities. Okay? So you've got this stuff, you've got the international human rights instruments, you've got the soft law, and then you've got things going on on the ground, and they're not unrelated. To a certain extent, the justification for engaging in these operational activities is because the norms exist, but also the activities themselves reinforce those norms. Okay? And the best example of this is one that I've already mentioned, the right to political participation. Okay? It's got this language. It talks about um, genuine periodic elections. I forget what the exact words are, but genuine periodic elections, universal suffrage, uh, secret ballots, but it doesn't say anything about the right of political parties to organize. So can you have a proper election in a one-party state? And the answer, as a result of 10, 20, 30, 40 years of electoral assistance election monitoring, is probably not. The international organizations and non-governmental organizations have consistently said that we're not going to declare an election free and fair if parties aren't given the right to organize. And so now, I would argue, and it's controversial, I would argue that it's part of the right to political participation, multi-party democracy. Okay? So in a way, the, con and the, the bigger point here is not that specific one, but the bigger point here is how these operational activities can reinforce the norms can actually strengthen the international norms, perhaps leading to a hardening of soft law into hard law. Okay? This one, very quickly here. An awful lot of organizations have provisions in their charters or protocols to their charters which says that unconstitutional changes in governments or an overturning of the democratic order will lead to suspension from the organization. And again, same as before, not so surprising with some of the European organizations. A little more surprising as you go down the list here. And uh, I won't go through them all, but um, uh, there, there, there is increasing evidence of international organizations acting on this. They don't do it consistently by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there's all sorts of hypocrisy here, and that's you know, what international politics is, uh, is all about in a way when it comes to the challenges of promoting norms is how, how do you promote a norm knowing perfectly well that it's never going to be promoted consistently. Okay? There, there are power issues, uh, calculations of interest here that mean it doesn't mean, that means it's not going to be applied consistently across the board. But nevertheless, there's sort of, again, a sort of building, a building uh, um, body of activity here which I think is significant and um, you know one of the recent ones that some of you may know have been involved in was in in Honduras when Honduras after the uh, coup of um, 
2009, was suspended from the Organization of American States, and then just a few weeks ago was allowed back in when Zelaya was allowed to return to Honduras for the first time. African Union. African Union is, is all over the place on this, but every time there's a crisis, there's questions about whether the country involved should be suspended. And so I think, if I'm not mistaken, Libya was recently suspended from the African Union, but Cote d'Ivoire was not. Okay? ECOWAS suspended Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, and I'm going to conclude with a few words about um, the Ivory Coast and, and Libya um, before I turn the floor over or open it to discussion. Okay? This, is, this is moving away now from uh, nonviolent democracy promotion. Okay? There are some examples of intervention, coercive military intervention, authorized by the United Nations Security Council for essentially the purpose of restoring democratically elected regimes. Okay? There were things going on in these places which were not only about democracy, but if you look at the resolutions that were adopted and you look at the timing of the action was taken, that is um, the principal reason for the intervention. And the Security Council, at least, which is only 15 countries, endorsed this. So the first was in Haiti in 1994 to restore democratically elected Jean-Bertrand Aristide to power. Um, lots happened after that, but the, US, the UN authorized a multinational force led by the United States to do this. And then in 1998, ECOWAS, this West African organization, intervened to restore President Kaba to power in Sierra Leone. And the Security Council didn't authorize it before the fact, but they welcomed it after the fact. Okay. The latest example is in Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. I say Cote d'Ivoire just because I was in the UN and that's, that's the language that's always used. Um, uh, Ivory Coast I'm talking about. Um, and uh, the interesting thing here is the connection between democracy, the restoration of democracy, and the concept of responsibility to protect, R2P, and this is something we can discuss a little bit. But Cote d'Ivoire highlights the connection there. What happened in Cote d'Ivoire? There was a peacekeeping mission there since 2004. Okay? The job of the peacekeeping mission was to provide some stability in order for a political process to move forward that would lead ultimately to presidential elections. Okay? Those elections were delayed over and over and over again. The political process moved in fits and starts, but finally by the end of 2010, it was possible to conduct these elections. The elections were held in December. Uh, the incumbent president, uh, Laurent Gbagbo, lost the elections. Uh, the international observers declared that he lost the elections. The national observers, the Independent Electoral Commission, declared that he lost the election. He got the Constitutional Court to somehow say, no, he won the election. And the victor, Ouattara, basically said, international community, national community, I won, help me to vindicate my victory. And the international community in the form of the UN, ECOWAS, the French had a big role here, were sort of wondering what do we do? Okay. How do we deal with this? In the past, often what happens in these circumstances is somebody brokers a power sharing deal, like in Kenya or Zimbabwe, and the feeling was we can't let this happen in Ivory Coast. We've been there for the last seven years trying to get to this point. We've now had an election, is widely perceived as having been won by one side, we can't just turn around and say, oh well, that's the way it goes. You know, life is tough, politics are tough. And so, and meanwhile, ECOWAS, the West African organization led by Nigeria, said shortly after that, in December 2010, after some political efforts weren't getting very far, said, if Bagbo fails to, head the, to heed the immutable demand of ECOWAS to hand over power, the community to be the community would be left with no alternative but to take other measures, including the use of legitimate force to achieve the goals of the Ivoirian people. Okay? And, uh, and Nigeria sought a resolution in the Security Council that would authorize that. Okay? That didn't happen. The Security Council wasn't ready to go that far in December. The African Union was prevaricating. ECOWAS went back in March, end of March 2011, said the same thing, called on the Security Council to authorize the UN peacekeeping mission there to use all necessary means to facilitate the immediate transfer of power to Alassane Ouattara. Okay? All necessary means is code word in UN jargon for the use of force. Okay? Security Council didn't go that far, 
But what the Security Council did is reaffirm and strengthen the so-called protection of civilian mandate that the UN peacekeeping mission had. Okay? It also imposed targeted sanctions on Bagbo and his supporters. It referred to the possibility of sending this to the International Criminal Court. And it sort of let the situation play out. Okay? And the way that the situation played out without withdrawing, because it was very possible that the peacekeepers could have withdrawn, that's always an option in these situations. There's no peace to keep, we got to go. The way the situation played out is that Ouattara supporters arrested Bagbo, essentially dragged him out of his presidential palace. Uh, the UN and French forces were all over the place. They'd actually, as, as far as I know, didn't go into the presidential palace. But I think the fact that they were there engaging in robust action to protect civilians made it possible for Ouattara forces to do this. And since then, he's been arrested and, you know, things are continuing, okay? Now, how things play out in Cote d'Ivoire is, is an interesting and difficult question. Um, in the meantime, Libya. Okay? This happened at almost exactly the same time. Okay? The crisis in Libya, the Security Council adopted a couple of resolutions, one of which referred Gaddafi and his supporters to the International Criminal Court, imposed sanctions, and then a little later, a resolution authorized all necessary means to protect civilians and actually invoked in the preambles to these resolutions the responsibility to protect. Okay? And the idea here is that governments have a responsibility to protect their own civilians, and if governments fail in that responsibility, the international community, through the Security Council, has the response, the right, and maybe even the responsibility to act on behalf of those victimized people. Okay? So Security Council adopts this resolution, much more controversial than in Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire, the vote was 15 to 0. Libya, the vote was 10 to 0 with five abstentions. Russia, China, India, Brazil, and Germany all abstained on this. Okay? And ever since then, you read about it every day in the newspaper, and we could have a discussion about this, but ever since then, NATO's action ostensibly is in the name of protection of civilians. That's what the Security Council authorized. That was the basis for the Arab League support. To the extent that the African Union supports this, the African Union support the votes in the Security Council. But the interpretive question here is, how far can you go in the name of protecting civilians? And the tough one is, can you go as far as regime change? Okay. Um, and uh, that question is not answered clearly anywhere, and there are differences of opinion about this, and ultimately how that question gets answered will depend on how things play out in the ground. Um, but what this means um, is that the Security Council has gone an awfully long way in the direction of promoting democracy, protecting civilians, and in the process of protecting civilians, indirectly authorizing regime change. Now, to some, this is not a good thing for the notion of responsibility to protect. Because the idea of a responsibility to protect is deeply divisive, very controversial. And a big part of the reason for the controversy is that it will be and has been interpreted to mean military action by the North against the South. Okay? It will be used selectively, not for humanitarian purposes, not for benign purposes, but essentially for the North, the Western, the powerful, to advance their interests against the weak. Again, in my view, much too simplistic a, a perspective on it. But final point here, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has bent over backwards to say the responsibility to protect is only in the furthest extreme as a last resort a formula for coercive military intervention. What responsibility to protect really means is the responsibility that states have to their own citizens, the responsibility that the international community has to help in ensuring civilians are protected from egregious violations. And the way the international community can help is through all sorts of things like helping to create justice institutions and monitoring human rights and diplomacy and stuff like that. Maybe um, non-coercive peacekeeping. And only when all of that fails do you turn to coercive action. Okay? The question I have in my mind is whether the situation in Libya, the situation in Cote d'Ivoire is going to reinforce this notion of a responsibility to protect and the connection between democratic governance 
or undermine it because it's going to look too much like, well, in the Cote d'Ivoire, it's basically the French and the Nigerians. You know, in Liberia, it's basically the, the Americans and the, and the French and the British. And uh, this is, you know, we, we've spent the last six or seven years telling you we're worried about precisely this eventuality, and here we have it before our eyes. I don't see it that way, but I can see that there's genuine concern about that, and you just have to look at the, uh, the way things are playing out um, in the diplomacy between the countries involved to see that there's a lot of controversy over this. Okay. Thank you. I, I've always found it um, ironic in a number of ways that um, various uh, autocrats in the uh, global south would talk about how uh, democracy is some kind of Western agenda, when in fact it's been Western powers that have largely been responsible for uh, backing, sometimes installing, uh, these uh, uh, very uh, dictatorships and certainly have provided most of the security assistance that these autocratic regimes have used to suppress uh, democratic uh, struggles. And so while I think the uh, you know, intergovernmental um, role of intergovernmental organizations and kind of institutional issues uh, that were, were uh, <clears throat> that uh, were, were just uh, talked about, I think, are, are certainly important and uh, issues. I, I, I want to focus more on the, um, the way that democracy really has spread, and that is through um, democratic civil society organizations engaged in strategic nonviolent action. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, survey that Freedom House uh, published a while back that uh, looked at the 70 or so transitions uh, in recent decades from dictatorship to various forms of democracy and they found that that yes there were some that were uh, elite led transitions there were a few where the dictatorship was overthrown through armed struggle only one or two cases of foreign intervention being decisive the vast majority close to three quarters of the cases were through um, Again, democratic civil society organizations engaged in strategic nonviolent action. Not all were as dramatic as, say, uh, what we saw in Cairo or uh, Belgrade or, or Manila, um, but you know, some were more gradual. But you know, the driving force you know, came from below. It, it came from, from people themselves. And so I wanted to kind of address you know, what kinds of roles uh, you know, uh, outside actors uh, can uh, or, sh or should not do <laughs> in, in supporting these kinds of, um, these kinds of, uh, of movements. Now, I mean, it's interesting that the rulers for, for many, many years, regardless of ideology, whenever they're being challenged, whether it be by armed struggle or nonviolent struggle, you know, say it's, as, it's, it's not, not, nothing, nothing we've done is anything wrong. They don't have legitimate uh, interests, uh, uh, concerns. This is done by outsiders, and they name whatever their favorite enemies are at the time. And they can be very creative in their combinations. I mean, what, what was it? What was it? Uh, was it Mubarak or Suleiman? So it was a coalition of the Israelis, Hezbollah, and you know, various other groups that were uh, you know, behind the protest. Uh, pardon? Yeah, in, uh, yes, yes. So, um, and, but but you know, I, I remember you know, during the revolutions and uh, socialist revolutions in Central America in the 1980s, uh, President Reagan, in all seriousness, uh, you know, said that this is part of a Soviet hit list. You know, they first they had Nicaragua, then El Salvador and Guatemala as part of an area to take over Central America, march up the isthmus through Mexico and take over the United States. And he warned, you know, Harlingen, Texas is closer to Managua than it is to Washington, D.C. And, um, and I remember as a child uh, seeing a propaganda film on Vietnam by the State Department where the opening scene was not a rice paddy or somewhere like that. It was a Munich conference of 1938 saying if we, this, is, this revolution in Vietnam was not a popular peasant revolution. Uh, it was a plot, again, hatched, hatched in, in Moscow. And so it was rather remarkable to in the, uh, you know, re the, the so-called color revolutions and you know, the, the uprisings in recent years in Serbia, Georgia, Ukraine, that you would, you'd, you'd hear, you know, even some, some you know, fairly, otherwise fairly thoughtful analysts on, on the anti-imperialist left saying that these were plots hatched in Washington. You know, the very mirror image of the Cold War, uh, uh, simplistic Cold War rhetoric that blamed, in, in Reagan's words, uh, the, if it weren't for the Soviet Union, there wouldn't be hot spots anywhere. And similarly, you know, that, 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 that these, these, uh, these revolutions uh, against, um, you know, uh, Milosevic, Shevardnadze, etc., were again, uh, you know, were not not indigenous, but were somehow these uh, these uh, uh, part of these uh, conspiracies. The um, 
And it's also interesting that many of these uh, you know, people, far left critics, were the very ones that I remember dismissing people like me for saying nonviolent revolution was even possible. You know, it was only through the battle, uh, barrel of a gun, only through armed struggle can dictatorships be overthrown. And they flipped to the other extreme saying, hey, it's so easy, you can, figure, you can launch it from a foreign capital. Um, but you know, the fact is, is, is that, um, yes, there was some small scale assistance through um, USAID and National Endowment for Democracy and some uh, equivalent uh, EU groups that, that's, that, uh, that helped uh, Otpor and, and, and Serbia and some other groups, uh, you know, buy computers and, um, uh, you know, and, and help, help with some, you know, some cost. Um, uh, helpful, perhaps, to some degree, and, and indeed, the Soviet Union, through, usually through Cuba or whatever, did provide some arms to Central American revolutionaries. But again, that does not cause, <laughs> that does not cause revolutions. And uh, you know, those of us who, who know uh, Ivan and other people in, in Atpur know that hardly being uh, American puppets, you know, they have traditionally been very critical of U.S. policy as, uh, in, in, in uh, not the least of the bombing of their country <laughs> in 1999, uh, but and that these are very much uh, independent actors, not the kind of people that can be uh, controlled from, from, the, um, from the outside. But, but it's interesting because we had a, a series of uprisings uh, in uh, uh, these Eastern European uh, uh, countries that were somewhat um, uh, not in a good relationship with the, uh, the, the United States. Uh, suddenly there's this idea that these things only seem to happen uh, in, um, in, in, in countries opposed, uh, that, that, that challenge U.S. hegemonic interest and therefore, you know, logically that they must you know, flow from Washington. But the reality is, is, is just the opposite. Even, even before the recent uprisings in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, twice as many autocrats uh, o uh, overthrown by nonviolent action were U.S. allies. I had a little chart. I originally thought my talk was going to be this afternoon. I was going to actually put it up on the wall, but I can, I can upload it onto, the, um, onto our, our, our um, Facebook uh, page if you want. But you know, I look at the, that, uh, the various uprisings and, and find that, again, the majority have been against U.S.-backed dictatorships, uh, not against uh, dictatorships opposed uh, by, the, um, by the United States. But, it, but in any case, I mean, when we think of intervention by, um, you know, United States, uh, Britain, you know, France. Uh, I mean, they, th these countries are, are good at at at, at um, coups, at uh, uh, counter revolutions, at, uh, that, at uh, these these sorts of things, helping an undemocratic minority seize power, or hold on to power. But you know, what does the CIA or MI6 know about nonviolence? <laughs> I mean, um, these are by their very nature um, the kind of movements that that that, that do come from the. You know, that come come from the bottom up. No foreign power really knows uh, the the complex combination of uh, internal forces and conditions and situations to uh, to to think of a, to to organize an effective strategy uh, that um, you know that can bring down uh, a, a dictatorship. The um, and it's interesting how in following the events in, in Egypt in particular. Uh, uh, that uh, all, it's, I've just never ceased to be amazed at all the ways some Western commentators have tried to deny agency to the Egyptians themselves. Um, I mean, some going as far as saying that Bush deserves credit because he put the idea of democracy in the heads of these Arabs that, uh, through, the, through the, the great model of the invasion of, of Iraq uh, and its great democracy agenda. But of course, as you, as you know, uh, you know, Bush uh, called for the spread of democracy from Damascus to Tehran. He didn't talk about, and though we all agree that Syria and Iran could use more democracy, obviously he, he did not say anything about spreading democracy from Tunis to Cairo, or Riyadh, or Manama, or Sana'a, or Muscat, or Rabat, or uh, any of the, the capitals of any uh, allied uh, regimes. Indeed, uh, U.S. aid to dictatorships uh, uh, grew uh, in the Middle East, grew under um, Bush despite the um, you know, pro-democracy uh, rhetoric. Uh, some want to uh, 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 attribute uh, Obama's speech in Cairo <laughs> as, as a spark. Uh, and though it wasn't a bad speech in a lot of ways, um, it's, it's, and, and to his credit, he allowed, uh, he insisted that opposition groups uh, have some representatives there in the auditorium where he spoke. It was interesting, Kafaya boycotted the, the main Egyptian um, 
a pro-democracy group uh, boycotted uh, the, the talk and said, said we, we, don't want, we don't want just words, we, we, we want actions. Um, the, you know, there, there, there's had been a, and, and uh, to, while rejecting some of the dangerous neoconservatism of his predecessors, uh, his predecessor, Obama unfortunately has fallen back in many ways on the realpolitik of previous administrations and, and supporting um, unconditional uh, security assistance to autocratic regimes, including over 1.5 billion dollars annually to uh, uh, to, to Mubarak. Um, some said, "Well, it wasn't all bad. I mean, the U.S. was, you know, NED, and these groups were actually giving some funding to some of these uh, pro pro democracy groups." Um, but n not only did it pale in comparison to the <laughs> billions of dollars uh, uh, in, in, in uh, propping up uh, Mubarak. Uh, but, but most of these, most of this money, while worthwhile, I think, in many respects, went more to elite oppositionist uh, groups, more kind of institutional building stuff. Not nothing on sort of the grassroots, nonviolent action training, the, the, you know, this kind of this kind of thing that really ended up being being uh, decisive in the struggle. And and even the limited uh, pro democracy funding was largely suspended after Obama had had come to um, come to office. So, no, no credit there. Um, <clears throat> Now there, there were some, there have been some articles um, that have come out reg regarding some of uh, some work by NGOs, including ICNC uh, and Canvas, uh, and, uh, uh, that uh, did work uh, did do some uh, seminars, uh, workshops on on strategic uh, nonviolent action, and I can I can and that they brought in some uh, academics, Western academics as well as veterans of struggles from Serbia, from South Africa, you know, from other countries, and. Um, I, you know, I, I, as one of those who took part <laughs> in, uh, in, in, in the, the, the most significant of these, uh, of these gatherings, I can say that the Egyptians were, were uh, already thinking about this, <laughs> already had, were, were very strong uh, strategically. Um, the work, despite what some reports said, this was not a how to overthrow Mubarak um, event. It was more on the generic uh, uh, information about you know the history and dynamics of, of nonviolent struggle. Yes, not 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 unlike a lot of the things we're covering, you know, covering here, and because because groups like uh, ICNC and uh, Canvas and others, I think we all recognize that um, we can't tell people what to do. Each country is, is unique in terms of the um, the dynamics within their within their country. One, one thing we don't want, to, want on, on our, our conscience to suggest a, a, a tactic where a bunch of people get massacred or, or, or that kind of thing. But again, more more in, importantly, uh, just as any kind of whether it be a, um, a guerrilla war or electoral campaign or, or whatever, you know, people who are on the ground they know the best about the strengths and weaknesses of their movement, the strengths and weaknesses of the opponents. You know how to uh, and uh, you know, how and and what. Strategies and uh, tactics and sequencings uh, uh, of tactics and, and coalitions and everything that they uh, that, that only they can figure out uh, figure out themselves, and I think that that's that's really um, uh, really critical. And again, if if the kind of capacity building work uh, that um, uh, I see and see other groups do can help people think about this kind of stuff. I mean, you think how to think about it, and again, not the specifics. Uh, great. And I think this is the, the diffusion of this kind of knowledge is really, uh, really important. And I like to think that it uh, is helping struggles for uh, democracy. That's why I do a lot of what I do. <laughs> and why a lot of us uh, affiliated with ICNC and other and similar groups do what we do. But uh, to somehow you know, give us, act like we're some kind of modern day Lawrence of Arabia <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Uh, and uh, because, you know, I, I had spent enough time in Egypt that I was actually one of the few Westerners who predicted the Egyptian revolution. And, and in fact, as recently as an article in early December, I said that it looks like Egypt could be the next country to do a Serbian style, uh, Filipino style, um, nonviolent pro democracy uh, revolution. This is before Tunisia. Uh, so, again, this is, you know, that, that and it was, it was not because of anything uh, uh, outsiders had done. But, it, but witnessing the, grow, the, the dramatic growth of civil society in Egypt, the brilliant strategic thinking you know, by the uh, young leaders of, uh, of April 6th and other movements. And, um, and really, that, that, is, that is how, how change, um, um, this is how these, these, these movements uh, spring, bring forth. But what can, we, can, what can outside actors do? Well, in terms of governments, I would say the first thing is, 
like the Hippocratic Oath, you know, for, for physicians, is first do no harm. <laughs> and, uh, and that would, you know, mean in, in many cases stopping providing security assistance and other uh, instruments of repression and other support for, for autocratic uh, um, um, uh, governments. And uh, I think um, in terms of what NGOs uh, can do, at least if you're from a country that is backing dictatorships, I think challenging your government's policies. <laughs> I mean, I, if we had time, I could tell some wonderful stories of, uh, of nonviolent actions, that some of which I've been a part of, that have challenged USA to repressive regimes and had a positive uh, political impact. That's, I think it's far more important than um, uh, you know, you know, taking part of a workshop in a foreign country, frankly. But, um, the, um, but yes, there are roles for sanctions, and, uh, and et cetera, as has, it has been, um, been mentioned uh, before, of carefully targeted. One thing that needs to be taken into account, again, with governments is the history in that area. I mean, you know, that East people in Poland and the uh, Baltic republics and Czechoslovakia who were struggling against, uh, against communism welcomed uh, U.S. support. The uh, United States was seen given, uh, as, as a supporter of freedom because uh, uh, successful U.S. administrations had supported uh, their struggles and, and opposed the Soviet Union. But let's take as a counterexample Iran. Uh, given the history, of, including the fact the U.S. overthrew the last democratic government that country had, supported the Shah and his brutality for quarter, you know, you know, a quarter century, uh, the, the threats of invasion and intervention uh, against Iran uh, subsequently, and including invading and overthrowing governments of the two neighboring countries. You know, it, you know too much involvement and support for the pro-democracy struggle could backfire. It could be used by the regime as an excuse of tying the opposition to uh, Western imperialism, and uh, and you know uh, Iranians across the spectrum are pretty nationalistic. <laughs> you know, uh, even the strongest opponents of the regime are not very happy uh, with the history of Western intervention uh, in their in their in their country. So yeah, this you know so uh, you know what what role an outside nation can do may have a lot to do with their history with that particular country and that um, and that part of, of the um, part of the world. There's more I, I could, I could uh, uh, um, and, and then also I should mention that certainly NGOs from uh, Western nations need to also be particularly sensitive in, certain, in, in, in these types of uh, you know, situations as well for, for similar reasons. Uh, often it helps to work through more you know, diverse, truly uh, international uh, kind of uh, context than one that is you know, necessarily based in Washington, D.C. or London or somewhere like that. And there's more I can say, but I've run out of time, but to hopefully get to some of it uh, during the questions. Uh, well, thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I am, I'm happy that you mentioned about the Atura and uh, that uh, experience and the intervention of, from the international community to promote the democratic governance. To me, this is political hypocrisy. Why? Absolutely. Because in 2003, I was working on a project in Gaza for democracy and civil society asking people to go and vote and practice the rule in, in voting for elections. In 2006, election took place in, in, in Palestine, and according to international organization, it was the most transparent and democratic elections in the Arab world. The result of that is sanction and punishing people because they practice the rule of democracy. And now, for over five, for the last five years, people in Gaza are suffering because they practice the rule of democracy. So how do you explain that when I go back to Gaza, next year we're going to have new elections, and asking them to go and vote to practice the rule of democracy? Just because I'm from the same area, you guys, <laughs> you know, and I was, I was like, okay, I want you to end up, you know, <laughs> just because I want you to be. So I think the international community, as you have said, that came up with the resolution to adopt the um, the right to democracy. I think it's um, it's genius to come up with a resolution to protect democracy, you know, the right to protect democracy, and um, yeah, it's uh, you know, like for Obama speech as you have mentioned, it is historical. That, that, that when we took place in, in Cairo, I still have it in my iPod, you know, I just always listen to it, you know. And uh, yeah, there should be a mechanism, you know, from the international community 
to protect such a democracy. You know, because when Palestinians went to election 2006, you know, we are tortured, you know, because of such practicing democracy uh, in a very transparent uh, manner took place there. And I don't know, like, this kind of um, double standard in, in treating democracy, when the Europeans, like, um, Italians go for democracy and elect Berlusconi, or our um, French Sarkozy, or um, <laughs> Egyptian, uh, or sorry, our Israelis go for liber, liber, the Liberman, such a criminal, you know? You know, it is it is right to in democracy, you know. But when it comes to Palestinians, go for elections, vote for a party that is not a favor with the international community, we are sanctioned, you know. And this is not, I mean, it's not rational, you know. So it's a quite dilemma, as Muhammad has highlighted, you know, like how to encourage people once again to go for election nowadays, you know. You know, this time we went for election and we are besieged, we are kidnapped, you know, in Gaza. Next time we we'll go for election. You know, I don't know what's going to happen then the result itself. You know. So how we could overcome such a situation, you know, or, yeah, what is your thought? Yeah. Um, do I need this? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I very briefly um, tried to, to allude to the problem of hypocrisy um, because you can never avoid that question. It's impossible to imagine that the international community, such as it exists, operating through international organizations, is ever going to be perfectly consistent. Most of what drives these decisions is deeply political, and those political decisions mean that like cases will not be treated alike all the time. The question I would throw back at you, and my instinct says, that if you've come out in favor of a set of norms, democracy, and you've acted on those norms, and you've articulated the fact that you're acting on the basis of those norms, doesn't it make it slightly more difficult to act hypocritically next time around? In other words, you know, look, you did it here, you said it there, you're in favor of it here, so why not there? Now, the, those with the power, those who are able to resist that kind of pressure will resist it. But I don't think it's inconsequential. So if you look at, um, um, you know, Throwing this out, if you look at how the U.S. has responded to the situation in Yemen, you know, I mean, this is an ally, you know, the president is an ally, and I suppose that it would have been very convenient for this never have up to have appeared on the international agenda or for the U.S. never to have been in the position of having to take a decision on where it will go and how far it will go. You know, same with Syria, same with Bahrain, Saudi Arabia and whatnot. Now you can see, it's not hard to see double standards at work in all of these circumstances, but the real question is, if you, if you didn't have the, the normative language, the normative rhetoric out there, and if you didn't have some places you can point to and you say, well, you did it there, and you said you did it there in the name of protecting civilians or in the name of promoting democracy, so how do you justify not doing it over here? And then you're a little bit on the defensive, and it means that, you know, there's a slightly greater chance, if you're sitting in the UN Security Council or if you're sitting in, in the governments of one of these powers, that you're going to think, oh, I guess we can't, you know, I guess it can't be business as usual anymore. But I certainly don't disagree that double standards are all over the place here. Yeah, but that rhetoric, has it ever manifested into effective political pressure? I think some, some I, I, I think I've taken there are times it has, it has indeed, that there is a, um, um, then it, it is politically far more difficult um, than it used to be uh, for the United States to, to support uh, uh, dictatorships. Uh, they, we still do. But it's much more of a fight. It's been lessened. It's just been, it's been with, uh, with, with, uh, with conditions. You know, there is a, um, uh, I mean, I, 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 those of you who are familiar with my writing on U.S. foreign policy know that um, at least half of it is about this kind of hypocrisy and, you know, blasting U.S. policy, particularly on Palestine, but on other, other issues, Western Sahara, and, you know, quite, you know, quite, quite a few, few others. But, uh, you know, if we waited for consistency um, uh, before doing anything, nothing would get done. And so... Um, uh, the problem is that sometimes if it's, it's you know, sometimes, a, 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 um, especially if it's a, an intervention that doesn't go well, it can actually make things worse. I mean, the Somalian intervention was, uh, there were some serious <laughs> problems with that, but that made, then made it, when Rwanda came along, 
was, was then used as an excuse not to intervene. I think most of us agree this is one case where, <laughs> you know, intervention would have been would have been when appropriate. So sometimes, if it's so brazen, it can uh, it can actually hurt uh, further on. But I, th I think, uh, on balance, I would have to agree that that uh, you know, that, that that more often than that than uh, that it it does maybe inch things at least a little forward despite the, uh, the the double standard. And just one sentence here to add on the Rwanda. Nicholas Kristof, an op-ed writer of the New York Times, put it well when he said, well, just because we didn't stop genocide in Rwanda, does that mean for the sake of consistency we shouldn't stop genocide anywhere? Yeah, we've never been interested in stopping genocide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to point to, I mean, you mentioned about the liberal peace uh, uh, building. And we know that the promotion of uh, democracy, I mean, particularly elections, uh, as a means of peace building, uh, has not been very successful or even failed in, especially in countries emerging from, from, from conflicts where people are divided along ethnic or religious or uh, linguistic lines. And because instead of uh, creating a participatory or inclusive government, it tends to reinforce these uh, conflict uh, structures. And uh, in, in, in case of Kenya or, or Zimbabwe, we know that they have come up with these unity uh, governments, and there are also criticisms of, you know, of, of, of these sort of unity governments. I just want to hear your views about, you know, whether it's elections or, or unity uh, yeah. governments. Well, where Western bias definitely does come in is I think there is a tendency here in the West to I mean elections equals democracy. Um, in fact, you know, one of the part of Bush's rhetoric was he, the fact that uh, Mubarak allowed for people to run against him in the most re re uh, recent presidential election, even though he, it was a totally fraudulent election where he got 80 something percent and he jailed, the, he threw the second place finisher in jail and that kind of thing. Bush praises as a sign of progress for democracy. Same with Salah's re election in Yemen. You know, um, you know same with these. Municipal advisory councils in Saudi Arabia, or whatever they were, that were you know that, that, where the, even the Saudis thought were a joke. Um, that that uh, this you know this this is how you know, Bush is defining uh, democracy. Well, well uh, you know um, elections can be manipulated. They can be be stolen. You know they can be you know all you know, all, all, all all sorts of things. And I think the, what's in, what's um, and to Obama's credit, he has, despite many criticism I have of him on this in this area, he has taken a some, somewhat more agency view of, of human rights, in that he really has he's been less ob obsessed with elections and has spoken more about you know freedom of media, you know freedom, uh, freedom of you know assembly, freedom you know, you know they, these these you know, providing the civic space uh, for you know civil society to grow and, and for democratic institutions from the bottom up uh, to to. Um, uh, uh, to come, but again, this is the, this, again this is the advantage of strategic nonviolent action, and that in 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 the f if, if, if a you know, nonviolent uh, uh, civil insurrection is what brings down a, a, a dictator and, cr and and creates the option for election, the very process that you have built a through coalition building, through through give and take, through the kind of pluralism that is necessary to build a mass movement capable of doing that, you start you know, that that's, that that helps build a, a foundation. For a more democratic society, whereas you know, if there you know, if uh, you know, uh, if there's an armed struggle that's based on martial values, an elite vanguard, you know, uh, power of the gun, you know, there, you know, not surprisingly, statistically, <laughs> dictatorships overthrown by armed revolutions more often than not become another dictatorship. And then when you try to intervention, you know, by, by through a, through a foreign power, and of course we've seen what you know elections have, have meant to Iraq. <laughs> so. Um, Again, it just goes back to 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 to. I, I think that the uh, the real area for um, you know democracy promotion has to come from within, and it has to uh, be from the grassroots, and 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 it, and, and uh, needs to be through through a nonviolent struggle. Do you want to call the? I don't know who's been speaking the most, or least. So why don't you call on, on people, Bill? And and then and one more. I got the other side. Uh, while there there might be uh, while there is international consensus about democracy, but if you ask anyone from my country, which is Pakistan, uh, they would say that there is international consensus 
um, there is a consensus in international community to support dictators in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And international community has been doing that consistently. Uh, when we had first military coup in Pakistan in late 1950s, uh, General Ayub came into power and the international community gave a lot of economic aid to Ayub's regime and which propped up the regime and you know which uh, helped Ayub spread this propaganda that the decade when he was ruling was was decade of development. Similarly when Musharraf came into power uh, there was huge economic aid from World Bank, IMF, USAID. So uh, Whereas you were saying in your presentation that the international community, you know, promotes democracy sometimes by giving economic aid and you know it helps in democracy. But in our case, in, in you know our country, international community has, if you take statistics, if you compare, whenever there are civilian governments, when they, whenever there are um, you know elected governments, there is almost no economic aid from the international community. But uh, you know, and and secondly. Uh, but the second point about the international community giving legitimacy to elections, uh, Ayub and uh, more recently uh, Pervez Musharraf, they always when they, they stay schools, they hold bogus referendums and they win, you know, they, they tell the people that 98% people have voted in their favor and, you know, they are going to rule the country. But uh, first of all, there is no criticism for, from the international community and even if there is, it doesn't matter because when the US president is uh, saying that Musharraf, a dictator, is his buddy, you know, it, it, you know so, yeah. Let's see, let's see let's, the questions now. Let's we have one open. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Can answer one together. And probably briefer questions. Well, my, my question is not uh, so much very different from uh, what others have raised, but uh, I think still aligning with uh, what uh, Ojot said. In uh, Africa, you find uh, most African countries, you find that the, 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 the politics is uh, divided along ethnic and uh, uh, linguistic lines. And my concern is always with uh, working with uh, some uh, uh, groups, but, uh, other monitoring the elections and other issues around democracy. I find it not very comfortable, the idea of most international uh, organizations coming in into um, a, a country, sometimes just less than or about a year to the elections. It, it either brings a, a lot of concerns among the citizens that they have some hidden interest mm -hmm. why they're coming in, but mostly to invest a lot of funds there. But I think the appropriate thing should have been to build the uh, civil society while there is no elections, build their capacity, prepare them such that when the election times are approaches, they are confident in themselves to be able to iron out their issues. Because I find out that there are quite a lot of issues that come up during the elections, which the international community <coughs> may not be able to handle. And they might handle it at a superficial level. Mm -hmm. And even when the elections are over, there are so many things that still crop up, which they cannot handle, because those things have always been there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to repeat what other people are saying. I agree with them fully about the hypocrisy of it. But there's also the danger of when, when people are saying, theoretically, the UN listens to what people are saying and is promoting democracy, and international organizations are doing the same. That is not true because uh, civil society organizations in Sudan, April 2010 elections, were actively um, advocating against the elections and saying that they were rigged. The elections were boycotted, but Carter Center, the international um, observers, said that it was credible. Uh, the UN said it was credible. Domestic observers says it's nonsense, but they didn't listen to them, and they said that actually, you know what, this uh, ICC criminal is a great man, and he's won fair and square. He rigged it, and everyone knew he rigged it, the UN and the international community, but they refused to do something about it. And the result of that is that the civil society was completely disempowered. Uh, political parties had no support because they, they looked like they had no power. The international community's support 
change the public opinion by saying that actually he has legitimacy and he quotes it every single time he stands there and talks. But Carter said he, he won fair and square. Yeah? Uh, it's led to displacement. South Kurdistan elections, the same thing. The international community has supported it. Displacements of thousands of people in the past two weeks because all, what, what do they want? The referendum to happen. Yes. And that's uh, just unacceptable. And the UN pretending that they're promoting democratic governance <laughs> is not true. Sorry. These, these are all good points, just very briefly. <laughs> just want, well, we just want to remind, remind, you know, get back to the point about what happens from the bottom up. Um, May, some of you may be familiar with Mali, uh, impoverished West African uh, landlocked uh, you know, country uh, has all the problems, you know, the, you know, many of the inherent problems of, of, of uh, post-colonial Africa. But in, in, in 1991, in a massive nonviolent uprising with no support from NGOs, no Facebook or Twitter, they mostly communicated using griots actually, um, traditional you know, singing storytellers, um, using um, you know, their, own, their own wits and, and courage, ingenuity, uh, despite hundreds of people being gunned down, uh, overthrew the Traore dictatorship, and Mali has been about the most stable uh, democratic country in West Africa uh, ever since, um, despite being you know, one of the poorest. Uh, and, um, and we've seen, um, we, and, and uh, <clears throat> you know, when, you know, and, and Sudan in 1964, uh, I guess Ayub in 1985 against Namari, the people engaged in a nonviolent civil insurrection, uh, overthrew those, uh, uh, you know, those uh, uh, Western-backed, uh, um, you know, uh, dictators. Uh, we saw how the lawyers and civil society movements in Pakistan, um, you know, uh, eventually, uh, you know, brought down, uh, uh, brought down uh, Mushar for the long history, you know, going up back to 1983 and the uprising in the south against, uh, against Zia. Um, and, you know, there's a, strong, there's a long, uh, you know, there's a long history there. And, and just let me tell you, I'll tell you one, one story of, um, of how, how when the U.S. was backing Yahya Khan, uh, especially, and it was particularly horrific during the slaughter in Bangladesh uh, in 1971. Um, a small group of uh, peace activists from Philadelphia, hearing that this arms shipment was going from a rail, uh, a rail center in Baltimore to, to, um, onto a Pakistani freighter, uh, a group of, uh, of Quakers and others blockaded the railroad track while others went out in canoes to make a little blockade against this huge freighter. The Coast Guard had to come out with grappling hooks and grab them out of the water. This got on national television, publicizing for the first time that the U.S. was secretly arming Yahya Khan. And people knew about the massacres in Bangladesh. They didn't know the U.S. was um, then East Pakistan. They didn't know the U.S. was um, uh, supporting it. The longshoremen's uh, un union, seeing what was going on, refused to cross the picket line and, and, load, the, um, uh, and load the freighter. And this is just a handful of, 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 of people using uh, here in this country. So again, that goes back to what I was trying to emphasize uh, about, about uh, you know, uh, nonviolent action you know, here in the West in solidarity uh, with those uh, struggling against um, um, uh, uh, dictators, uh, yes, back dictatorships. Um, yeah, uh, on the, back, just very briefly again, back to the, the problem of hypocrisy and, uh, and it's not, at all difficult to come up with situations where the great powers, the international community, the UN, the organizations have acted in a manner that is not inconsistent with what they preach. And I would appeal to you that use this hypocrisy, democracies in particular, at a certain point, at a certain level, feel some pressure to match deeds with words. And so you're right that you can always point to places, well, if this is true, then how do you explain that and that and that? And there's all sorts of hypocrisy out there. But that is, in a way, the, the mere fact that you've got some normative standards, because it seems to me that there's a greater risk here that can, you're going to say the international community, international standards, international organizations are completely irrelevant in the grand scheme of things, as opposed to places, um, vehicles for advancing some of the principles that we're talking about here. And if you dismiss them completely, you basically leave the national, because we live in an interdependent world, you kind of leave the national actors on their own. You know? I mean, part of the reason why people who can have a say or feel they can legitimately act in countries of which they're not citizens is because this sense of interdependence, and this interdependence depends in part on a sense of normative standards that they can appeal to. And those standards are expressed in and through international organizations, and it may, it may look to you like it's, it's 
90 percent of the time not being upheld. But if you can point to those standards, I would argue that it's, that a certain level you're going to put pressure on actors that wouldn't otherwise feel that pressure. Bill, Bill, can I ask a question yes. that has a one-word answer of each of them? I, I, yes, the the historian Timothy Garden Ash says there needs to be a right to civil resistance. Yes or no? Oh, definitely. Should be a right. Right, this is a right. There needs to be a right, a, an international human right to civil resistance. I, I can't, I can't give a one-word answer because I have to. I, I, you'd have to define civil resistance for me, and whether that is that already embodied in human rights law, or is it a new, yes. new human peaceful right? assembly in the First Amendment? To the extent that it's already in human rights law, of course. So maybe my answer would be no, since it's already there. Whatever you.